How many years when we've been here on this Sunday, first Sunday of July? Uh, normally we're all at camp, and normally I'm not preaching this Sunday, so uh, it's, it's different. When I was going to university uh, in Edmonton, during the summers, <clears throat> I did some pulpit supply. So we used to go to some of the rural churches all around Edmonton, Wetaskiwin and Killam churches like that, and I had the opportunity to do some, some preaching. And the summer months have always been difficult because everything's happening in the summer. You've got a thousand and one things that you want to do and you are doing, and you're trying to get them done, and then you're trying to prepare. So this week for me has been unique. <laughs> I did prepare, I did spend a lot of time there at the church, but how do you keep your mind in gear when you hear the birds singing and yeah. smell the smells and the fresh breezes and you're trying to concentrate on what you're doing and uh, it's, it's difficult to do. Uh, anyway, I, I did have a good time preparing and uh, I did get some preparation done and the Lord did give me what I consider is a message that he wants me to, to share with you this morning. We're going to look at one verse this morning, and we read it last week. And that verse is Romans chapter 3, verse 23. Probably everyone here could quote that verse. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Very, very simple verse, but filled with tremendous, tremendous truth. Let's pray before we look at this. Father, guide us this morning as we turn our attention to the Word. Father, we know that you take your Word and you use it to sanctify, to set us apart unto yourself, and to purify our lives and our hearts before you. And so we ask this morning, Father, that you would guide and direct us by the Spirit into the truth that you have for us, uh, that it might impact us and that our, our lives might in turn magnify and glorify you. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, last week we looked at <clears throat> the first three verses here. Uh, well, not first three, but the first three verses in the beginning of Paul's explanation of the gospel, uh, beginning at verse 21. And last week we spent a bit of time talking about the whole issue of the glory of God. Uh, we concluded the message last week uh, with just a little excerpt from uh, John Piper as he tried to explain how you would communicate to a four-year-old what the glory of God means. And his statement was a good statement. He said basically that unless you're able to explain what you're saying to a four-year-old, you don't understand what you're saying. <laughs> now that's a very easy statement to make. <laughs> but when you're when you're dealing with some pretty deep theological truths and you try and condense them into simple terms so that anyone can understand them, uh, it's actually quite difficult to do. And I've wrestled with this whole issue here in the last few weeks of the glory of God. The glory of God basically is talking about God's self-revelation, about God displaying or the display of God in terms of who he is in his essence. The glory of God is all that God is in and of himself. And so what Paul is saying here when he talks about all sinning uh, and coming short of the glory of God, he is saying that the glory of God was the target of creation when God created man. God created man so that we would glorify him. And of course, when we talk about glorifying God, we're not talking about changing Him in any way. That's impossible. Uh, uh, we don't glorify God in the sense that somehow we can change the character or nature of God. God is who God is, and God will always be who He is, and He will never change. So then, what does it mean to glorify God? Uh, basically what it means, it means to acknowledge who He is, to acknowledge the reality that God is the possessor of all things, that he is the possessor of all righteousness, of holiness, of purity, of wisdom, of grace, of love. There is nothing about any of those qualities 
that God does not have in its absolute fullness and perfection. So when the arrow was aimed at the target, which was the glory of God, and that arrow came short of that target, which is what sin means, it's falling short. And uh, he says here that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It's a combination of two terms. Sin means missing the mark, and then he adds this word, falling short. But as you read that, there are two different tenses that are used in, in the verbs that are used here. And I want to draw that to your attention this morning because it's important. He says, first of all, that all have sinned. And that is in the aorist tense. Well, what does that mean? It means that it is a completed act in past time. So what he is saying here, at some time in the past, all of humanity sinned. It's been done. And of course, we understand what that means because we're taught that in the book of Romans and other places, that what Paul is talking about here is the original sin, uh, the sin of Adam. If you look at chapter 5 in Romans, verse 12, it says this, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all have sinned. So the sin that was committed was committed by Adam. But Adam was the federal head of all of humanity. And so in that one specific act of sin, all of mankind sinned. And that's what Paul is referring to in Romans 3.23 when he said, for all have sinned. It's a past act. It's singular. Uh, there's not a million sins involved in this. There is one. All have sinned. That's the original sin. That is the fall. And then the second word he uses, and have fallen short of the glory of God, is interesting. It's very colorful when you see it. This is in the present tense. It is a continuous, ongoing action. So what Paul is saying here is that there was one sin, and as a result of that one sin, we continuously miss the mark. Continuously. So the sin of Adam has passed on to every person. That's called original sin. Our Catholic friends would use that term, original sin. But that original sin is such that it has defiled the nature of man in the sense that now that all, all of what man does is falling short, continuously, continuous. Every single day, day after day after day after day after day through the history of man, all that man can do now is fall short of the glory of God. The glory of God was supposed to be the goal of our lives. What does that mean? It means that we were supposed to have found in God everything that we need for meaning, purpose, direction, for joy, peace. All of those things are supposed to be found in Him. And when Adam sinned in the garden, we forfeited that because we said, no, there's something more than what God has offered me. And so rather than being satisfied in him, we reached out for that fruit. And I say we because we were there in Adam. We reached out for that fruit. And the moment we reached out for that fruit, something happened to our nature. So that now we are no longer able to find in God all that we need. He is supposed to be the focal point of our life. He is supposed to be central in everything. He is supposed to be the driving force behind all that we think, all that we say, all that we do. Our entire lives are supposed to be wrapped up and oriented in Him. And we know, of course, that that isn't true. Well, the reason I'm dwelling on this this morning is it came to me that unless we understand that what Paul is doing in the book of Romans is showing us how that God orientation is restored in the heart, in the life of an individual, we don't understand the book of Romans. It's all about God. And we are prone and tend always when we are studying the scriptures to make it all about ourselves. <laughs> the book of Romans isn't about us. The book of Romans is about this glory, this, this central place that God is supposed to have in the life of every individual, which we forfeited in the garden. 
And the book of Romans is about the restoration of that glory. It's about the restoration of God's position of absolute prominence in the life of man. It's not about man. It's about God. That's what the whole book is about. It's about restoring the glory. Restoring the glory. Well, God didn't lose his glory. We're not talking about it in that sense. Restoring the glory in the sense that that glory becomes the driving force and the passion of our lives. And so Paul is going to be describing how that passion is restored to the heart of man. There are two words that he's going to dwell on. Well, one word in particular, the other word isn't mentioned very often in Romans, but uh, he does mention it. There are two words that are critical. There is the word justification, and there is the word sanctification. Justification and sanctification. Paul uses the word justification in the book of Romans. I think he uses it about uh, 13 times. I, I tried to go through, I took a lexicon and I took a Greek lexicon and I went through and tried to identify all the words. And uh, somewhere around 13 times in the book of Romans, Paul uses the word justify. The word sanctify or sanctification is used in the book of Romans only about three times, but it is there. So let's look first of all at this, at this word justification. Let's look at a verse to begin with in chapter 5, verse 1 of Romans. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's also found in chapter 3, verse 24. Being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Now the word justification is the word righteous. To make righteous is the idea. Actually the word righteousness and the word justification come from the same root word in the Greek. So when Paul is talking about justification, he is talking about one being made righteous in the sight of God. Justification is a legal term. Now that's important. It's a legal term. What does that mean? That means that he is envisioning a court of law where we are standing before the judge and the judge is evaluating whether we are innocent or guilty. And the verdict that God pronounces on us who have faith in Christ is a verdict of not guilty. <laughs> it's amazing. It's an amazing truth. Uh, it's incredible, actually, that we are standing in the eternal court before a holy God who knows absolutely everything about us. And in that court, because of our faith in Christ, God pronounces us not guilty. Or, to put it from the positive perspective, God says he's acceptable. He harmonizes with all that I expect and all that I want. And of course, we know that that takes place only because of what Christ has done. We're going to be talking about justification quite a bit in the next few <coughs> weeks and months. But the whole issue in justification is that there is a righteousness that God gives to us as a gift. That's the basis of the justification. Paul says in chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed. God's righteousness is revealed from faith to faith. So the righteousness that God has for us is given to us as a gift, and that is given to us as a gift when we place our faith in Christ. So this is a legal transaction. It takes place before the bar of God. <laughs> and so we now are credited, we're told in chapter 4, that we are credited with the righteousness of Christ. The word used there is imputed. It's placed on our account. It's in our bank account. His righteousness belongs to us. Uh, we are, we sing that song, clothed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. That's what they're saying in that song. We are given a garment. It's the garment of righteousness. 
And when God views us now, he views us in his son and he sees us as perfect in standing. So that is the beginning of restoration, of the restoration of the glory of God. Because what happens in justification is now I have unlimited, unhindered access into the very presence of God. Now I am able to have a personal encounter with Him, a personal relationship with Him, because of the fact that I am united with Christ, I am clothed in Christ's perfections, and in those perfections now I am able to stand in the presence of a holy God. So that is the beginning of the restoration of the image of God in man, and it's the beginning of the restoration of the glory of God being recognized by man. The second word that we need to look at when it comes to this whole issue of the restoration of the glory is the issue of sanctification. Sanctification is the same word, the same root word, holy. The idea in sanctification is to be set apart unto something. Paul uses that word in Romans chapter 6 in particular. Uh, Romans chapter 6, let's see if I can find the verse, I think it's verse 19. I'm speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh, for just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification. Sanctification, we could say, resulting in holiness. And then if you look at verse 22, but now having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your benefit resulting in sanctification and the outcome, eternal life. Sanctification is a moral term. You have to remember that. Stash that away in your mind. Justification is a legal term. Sanctification is a moral term. Justification gives us a standing of perfection before God. But sanctification gives us a heart that pursues God. Let me say that again. Justification gives us a right standing before God. It's a legal term. It's the basis upon which I approach God every time I come to Him in the name of Christ. Justification is the base of that, basis of that. Sanctification, being made holy, is a moral term. And by that we mean that it talks about the issues that flow from the heart. You see, this isn't just... Uh, salvation is not just a picture of becoming pristine and spotless. <laughs> That's what the Pharisees tried to do, right? They tried to become perfect and they were law abiders and they... They became very, very rigid in their approach to life. And uh, Paul says uh, that he was, as, uh, as the Pharisee, uh, he was a keeper of the law and he was blameless. That's not what happens in salvation. We are blameless. Uh, we do become keepers of the law, but it is not legalistic. It proceeds from the heart because God transforms the inner man, and it is from that inner man that flows this life. That's sanctification. So sanctification is a moral issue, and deals with the inclination of the heart. Back, way back in Genesis, chapter six, verse five, we read these words, and this is just before God destroyed the world with a flood. Genesis chapter six, verse five says this, then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continuously. Let me read that again. That the thoughts, that the intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That is exactly the opposite of sanctification. That is an inclination towards evil. That is original sin. There is a bent to do wrong. That's what he's describing there. Sanctification in the New Testament is the exact opposite of that. 
It is the inclination to do right. And in sanctification, you have that moral quality where God implants within us the very nature of Christ. Christ himself lives in us. There is a new life embedded in us. And all from that new life, there flows a new life. But it starts in the heart. It's within the heart that the inclination is embedded. In, Rome, in Hebrews chapter 10, I believe it's chapter 10, verses 14 through 18, there's a great portion that talks about sanctification that helps to explain this whole issue. Hebrews chapter 10, beginning at verse 14. Listen to these words now. For by one offering, Hebrews 10, 14, for by one offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Let's stop there. There is one offering that has perfected all of God's people for all time. The perfection he's talking about there is the completion of sanctification. So somewhere in the future, our hearts will be totally inclined to God. But he says that when we come to Christ, we become perfect in the area of sanctification. It could be confusing. There is a positional sanctification, he's telling us this, that takes place. And what happens in that positional sanctification? There is a new heart given to us. A new heart is placed within us. And perfection comes from that new heart. We are perfect, we've been given the new heart, and that works itself progressively, works itself out progressively through our lives. But it comes from the new heart. It doesn't come from a legalistic discipline and an observance of law. It comes from a life that God embeds in the heart of his children. Let's read the rest of this in its context. Verse 15, and the Holy Spirit also testifies to us, for after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them, after those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws upon their heart and on their mind, I will write them. He then says, and their sins and their lawless deeds, I will remember no more. God writes his law upon the heart. That's sanctification. That's what it's all about. And that law which is written upon the heart is written there by the presence of the Spirit of God who imparts to us this life that Jesus has for us. We become united with Christ. And it is from that union that this sanctification, this becoming holy, this becoming totally inclined to God. And the end product of that sanctification is the glory of God is the total focus of my life. So justification puts us in right standing with God so that we can have communion and fellowship with Him. Sanctification places within us the inclination to do those things that God commands us to do. You see with the law, the law commands us to do, but it doesn't give us the inclination to do it, nor does it give us the strength to do it. In Christ, in sanctification, we have the inclination to do, and we also have the power to do because of the presence of the Spirit. And that is the message of the Apostle Paul uh, in the book of Romans. If you can remember those two words, justification, a legal standing before God, sanctification, a moral standing before God. This is really critical, people. I spent many, many years in my Christian life trying to figure out this simple thing. And I was confused and frustrated because I always felt that there was more, and there was more, and there was more, and I didn't have it, and I was looking for more and more. Without realizing that what I needed was for God to take the blinders off of my eyes so I could see what I had. And when God began to do that for me, it transformed my life. All of life makes sense to me now. It didn't before. You see, sanctification is a process that God initiates through giving me this holy inclination. 
And that process works itself out in every detail of life. Good and bad. <laughs> Rich and poor. It doesn't matter where I'm involved on that scale. The reality is this, that God has initiated this longing in my heart to see Him, to know Him, to walk with Him, to desire Him, to long for Him, to pursue Him. That's what sanctification is all about. You see, justification doesn't give you that. It gives you a standing. But it doesn't give you a heart. That's why sanctification is so important. It gives you the heart. God places within you the heart to know Him. You've heard me say many, many times, and I will continue to say it because I do believe it is true. I am extremely troubled when I hear people talking about their conversion experience and there is absolutely no desire whatsoever, whatsoever in their heart to pursue God. I say, something's got to be wrong. This, this isn't right. Because <laughs> when God saves us, He justifies us and He sanctifies us. And if that is true, there has to be this desire to glorify God. The glory needs to be restored. There is the initial beginning of it with the reception of new life, but then there is the continuous process of growing in this continuously. And to say that we are justified, but we don't ever talk about being sanctified, to me puts up red flags. You can't separate them. The one who is justified will be sanctified and glorified. It's a process and it's guaranteed by God, not by us. And so there has to be a connection between my conversion, receiving this great gift of righteousness, of right standing with God, and this whole process of living out this life in all of life's experiences. There's a verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30 I want to close with. 1 Corinthians 1.30. This is a very familiar verse for a lot of people. But by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption. The key to each of those terms in that verse 30 of 1 Corinthians chapter 1 is the reality that we are in Christ. There is a union that takes place in new birth. When we turn in faith to Jesus for cleansing from sin, we become recipients of a new life. God places within us His Spirit. Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 1 that we are part or 2 Peter chapter 1, we are partakers of a divine nature. Uh, the Spirit of God comes to live within us and we're, our spirits and the Spirit of Christ are united. We become one. That's what Paul is saying here. In Christ, in that union that you have with Him, these things are true. He becomes to us wisdom. In Corinthians, uh, just before this, he talks about Christ being the wisdom of God and the power of God. So Christ becomes wisdom to us. What is that? Because of the relationship with Christ, we begin to understand what life is all about. He is our wisdom. Life unfolds when you know Christ. The second thing that he mentions here is that he has made unto us righteousness. That's justification. We've been talking about the gift of righteousness. Uh, we are clothed with the perfections of Christ. And then he says, and sanctification. Sanctification is a guaranteed outcome of the new birth, of being in Christ. If you are in Christ, you will be sanctified. What does that mean? Sanctification is a moral term. Sanctification, sanctification talks about the inclination of the heart, the passion of the heart, the direction of the heart. So the one who is in Christ receives a new heart and that heart is focused on God and that heart begins to pursue Him. 
That's what sanctification is all about. And we're given that. Now listen. Listen. We're given that as a gift. <coughs> you don't earn that. You don't work for it. You don't strive for it. It's ours because we are in Christ. It's ours. I remember years ago when I was in Bible college, I read from Matthew chapter 5 or 6, I think it is. Uh, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. I didn't understand the connection between that verse and what I'm talking to you about today. I was not far enough along in my Christian walk to understand some of these things. But I remember, this was in a library at the school, I remember praying, God, that's what I need. I need the hunger. I need the hunger and I need the thirst. Because if the hunger and the thirst are there, I will be filled. Little did I realize that the hunger and the thirst were already there. <laughs> I went about many, many years trying to work this thing up in emotions and devotions and you name it. Uh, it doesn't happen that way, it happens by faith. It's a simple resting in the reality of what we have in Christ. So if you are a believer, if Jesus Christ is your Savior and Jesus Christ is in your life, I can guarantee you this, you have a new heart. And if you start listening to that new heart, you will find new direction. God will take you in the direction He wants you to go. God will give you the desires of your heart. Not only will He give you what you desire, but He will give the desire itself to you as a Christian. That's what sanctification is. People, listen, God has placed that in us as His children. It's possible for us to quench the thirst on other things. That's why we're told in the Scriptures, put off the old man, put on the new man. We're told not to walk in the flesh, walk in the spirit. That's sanctification. It's related to this whole issue. If we want to grow in that restoration of the glory of God, of God becoming the focus of our life, I can guarantee you one thing, you need to be in the Word. Jesus prayed in John 17, 17, sanctify them through the truth. Thy Word is truth. Sanctify them. What's that mean? I want you to develop in the hearts of my people a passion for God. That's what it means. And how will that happen? It will happen through your Word. Through the Word of God. This book is living. It's a living book. It's a, it's a living document. It's not just words on a page. It's given to us by the breath of the Spirit. And the Spirit accompanies the Word. When you, when you begin to meditate on the Scriptures, I can guarantee you that the Holy Spirit of God is there seeking to teach you and to develop you in your understanding of Christ and of spiritual truth and of your relationship with God. If we are to facilitate, and we can, we can either hinder or we can facilitate this ministry of the Spirit of sanctification within us. If we are to facilitate it, I can guarantee you this, it will not happen unless you're in the Word. That's how it happens. It happens here. I am not opposed to people having wonderful experiences with God. I think those things happen. But if you build, try to build your life on the basis of those experiences, you're going to need a new one every day. And it's going, to get, it's going to get to the point where you need ten of you, Or you're never going to be satisfied. That's not it. It's not about that. It's about the new heart. It's about the work of the Spirit in transforming us from within. He, he has sanctified us already. He's given us this passion, this desire for God. Now we need to begin to feed it. Feed that passion. Let it grow. Let it develop. Listen to what the Spirit of God is telling us. I think probably one of the things that I appreciate the most being able to not have to go to work five days a week and come home absolutely dead tired and hardly able to get up the next morning. The thing I appreciate the most of all what I'm able to do now is in the mornings, and I know this, you can't, a lot of you can't do this. Uh, 
retire, then you can do it. <laughs> I can get up in the morning, first thing I do is I sit down at the breakfast table and I open up the scriptures and I start to read. That's the first thing I do, I start to read. And I'll tell you, I enjoy that. I enjoy that. The little nuggets that I get sitting there at the table reading the scriptures are just incredible. Just little thoughts that come. And, and it's like lighting a fire in you. There's a little coal. It's like something breathes on that coal and there's a flicker of a flame. That's the ministry of the Spirit, using the Word to encourage us. And, and I really enjoy being able to do that. And that's something that we must do if we want to grow in grace. Well, we could go on and on. I realize that this is a very, very general message this morning. It's covering a lot of bases. There's a lot of implications to what I said. But I really felt that I had to do this so that when we work our way through the book of Romans, we understand that it's all about God and it's not about us. And what Paul is doing in the book of Romans, he is telling us how God restores the focus of our lives so that he is central. And the target is being hit. It's not being missed, no. The arrow doesn't fall short, no. The arrow makes its mark, it's its mark. And the mark is the glory of God. He is everything. That's what it's all about. Well, let's pray. Father, take these random wandering thoughts this morning. Just use them to encourage the hearts of your people. Father, we're so grateful to you for what you have done for us in Christ. And Father, it's just incredible to understand and begin to appreciate that it's a gift, it's grace. It just seems so unbelievable at times, Father. It seems like there's something we should do or something that we should present to you, but we can't. We can present nothing. We just come with our empty hearts and our empty hands and ask you to fill us. And we thank you that you do. We pray in Christ's name. process of sanctification, we still have a God who will listen to us babble on about our problems. <laughs> and uh, he cares. He cares about what's going on in our lives. And, and uh, we don't just have to put on a happy face and, and praise him all the time. Actually, the first time I heard this song, it's an Amy Grant song. I kind of did a little double take on the, on the first part of the chorus. It says, we pour out our miseries, God just hears a melody. And I thought, Okay. But then I thought about, as a parent, how I feel when my kids come to me and they tell me what's really going on in their heart. You know, sometimes as grown children, especially, they come home and, and they'll put on a happy face and just tell me everything's good and, you know, there's no real deep conversation. But when they want to go deep, it's like my heart just goes, Ooh, that's nice. Because <laughs> I just love that relationship. And uh, I think that's what Amy was getting at when she wrote this song. God loves a lullaby in a mother's tears in the dead of night better than a hallelujah sometime. God loves the drunkard's cry, the soldier's plea not to let him die better than a hallelujah sometime. Thank you. 